Hi, uh, good evening. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you to the Society of Skeletal Radiology uh, Resident Education Webinar. Uh, my name is Naveen Subash. I'm from the Cleveland Clinic, and I'll be serving as the moderator for this session. Um, just as a reminder, uh, if all of you who are logged in can sign into the poll everywhere so that uh, you, know, you can answer some questions that um, Dr. Lin will be uh, presenting through her um, talk. Um, and uh, without much uh, further, I'd like to um, introduce um, Dr. Dana Lin, uh, who is going to be our speaker today. Uh, she is an assistant professor at NYU, uh, where she's been since 2018. She completed her residency in Columbia, where she was chief resident, and then did her fellowship in musculoskeletal radiology at NYU. Um, uh, she is definitely a rising star in musculoskeletal radiology. Um, and she is, you know, regularly speaks at um, and moderates at our national international meetings, uh, as well as uh, many CME courses. And her research interests uh, include uh, uh, artificial intelligence and deep learning applications in musculoskeletal imaging and uh, practice variations and standardization in musculoskeletal imaging interpretations. And uh, it's my pleasure to hear her talk about how to be a carpal boss and approach to wrist MRI. Uh, Dana, please take it away. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. It's really my pleasure to speak with all of you today um, about an approach to wrist MRI. I remember thinking when I was a resident and a fellow, just being very intimidated by this type of study and um, taking quite a long time during my fellowship to really feel comfortable with it. So hopefully um, I can give you some pointers here and there that will be helpful for you. Um, I was actually invited to give this talk almost a year ago. And I think maybe at that time, I'm now a little bit embarrassed. They asked me to generate a title and I guess I came up with how to how to be a carpal boss, um, which is a little bit of a pun. Um, but um, so I don't know if I'm dating myself right now, if anyone in the audience knows who this is or whether you guys are all Harry Styles and Bad Bunny fans. But um, you know, this is, if you're a hip hop fan, this is Rick Ross and then this is um, Tupac and the notorious Biggie, Biggie Smalls, right? And um, big pun. So um, it's, I hope this is not like me presenting like a slide with like the Bee Gees or something like that. Um, so yeah, hopefully after this, you'll feel like a carpal, like a boss about the risk. Um, and that's basically my goal um, and objective for this talk today. So just to make sure that, um, the poll everywhere function is working. I just wanted to start with this very simple poll um, just to get a gauge also of where you guys are at in terms of how you feel about wrist MRI. So I'm gonna give for each of these poll everywhere um, questions, I'm gonna give about 10 seconds just because I'm, I do have a lot of cases that I'd like to get through. Um, so once we get like a general sense of people participating, I'm just gonna move on. Okay, so moving, moving. Some of you guys are really confident. I love it. All right. So most of you guys, as I thought, were probably um, maybe one to three, right? Scores one to three about how you feel about reading wrist MRI. And hopefully I can change that by the end of this, this talk. Okay, I'm just gonna move on for the sake of time. So, sorry for some reason it's not advancing. Okay, so I'm just gonna set some ground rules. Um, you guys have already been really awesome about participating. I really want this to be interactive. I was tasked with giving a talk on an approach, which really, for my mind, is a little bit of a didactic talk, but because you know these um, resident education club talks are meant to be case-based, we're gonna do it a little bit um, you know, backwards such that we'll take, we'll develop the approach by looking at some cases of common pathology and then I'll go through you know, the anatomy and all that, all that stuff as we go through each of the major structures. Um, I really don't want you to worry about being right. I, everything I, that is like etched into my, into my own brain from training is from cases that I was stumped by or, or got wrong. So just commit to an answer, move on. And then the whole point um, of this talk is just to get you guys more comfortable with reading rest MRI. And I try to organize the cases that I'm showing around sort of basic themes and maybe as we go on you'll kind of get a sense for um, where I'm going to try and group the different pathologies to kind of organize it in a way that makes sense. Um, okay so I'm just going to start with this case. So this is a 25 year old male with chronic wrist pain after trauma for one year ago and I'm going to give you a second to look at this image and then I'm going to give you a hint that the tough thing about showing cases that oftentimes there isn't like more than, there's often more than one abnormality on the, on the image, but um, the finding that I'm 
I'm, I'm trying to highlight here is a soft tissue finding. So ignore anything that you're seeing in the bones. For some reason it's not, is it showing? Okay, great. So go ahead, I'm gonna give you about 10 seconds. Okay. I love it. Okay, so that's my timer going off. Great. All right, so we're going to move on. So these are some, these, I'm going to tell you guys that, can you guys see my cursor, by the way? Like, yes, no? Yes. Okay, great. So the people who circled over here are the people who got, um, this is this is correct, right? So this is what we're looking at. And I'm going to show you some axial images through the same structure. And I just want you to focus on this area here and here as well. And then we're going to talk about what what's abnormal, okay? So these are some sequential images through that same structure. And we'll come back to the images again. So what was this? This was a scapholunate ligament tear, right? And the scapholunate ligament is one of the, it's probably the, the most important um, intrinsic ligament of the wrist for carpal stability, right? And so this clinically presents with pain, weakness along the dorsal or radial aspect of the wrist. And when you're looking for abnormalities, which is what we were showing with this case, is that you're looking for discontinuity of the ligament with fluid between the ligament and the bone, complete or complete absence of the ligament, or you can have distorted morphology with fraying, thinning, or irregularity, or you can have an elongated ligament without discontinuity with widening of the scapulinae joint space. So going back to some of the images that we saw here, right, and the coronal image right here, this is the scapulinae ligament, right, and there's fluid interposed between the ligament and the adjacent bone. This ligament should be attaching to both parts of the scaphoid and the lig ligament right here. And then the morphology is also distorted. This normally, this is very irregular in morphology. And then on the axial images, right, we'll see some examples of normal, but just remember how sort of amorphous and inhomogeneous and completely distorted and inter like increased in signal this looks. Um, and then, and basically how you can't connect the structure at all. So this is a schematic showing the normal anatomy of the scapholinate ligament. And it, I used to be very confused by this because I just thought, well, a ligament just connects, you know, it should just be one structure that kind of goes from one thing to another, like one band. But the scapholinate ligament is kind of like a horseshoe shaped structure. It's kind of like a U or C shaped structure that cradles the scaphoid and the lunate um, along sort of the bottom and, the, and, and then along the dorsal and volar aspects. And, as you scroll sequentially through coronal images, they actually look, the different components look different. So there's a dorsal band and there's a volar component and there's a middle component. And so this is just showing you that the volar component tends to have a trapezoidal appearance. So here, this is them trying to show this particular schematic, trying to show that this is the trapezoidal appearance of it on the coronal. The middle component tends to be more triangular in morphology. So this is kind of them showing the middle component of the, of the scapholinate ligament. And then the dorsal band is more band-like. And so this is, they're trying to show that this is more band-like. So you kind of have to understand that as you're going through it, it's not uniform in its morphology. And you should expect to see these sort of shapes as you go through um, from front to back. And then on the axial, what we were missing on that prior pathologic case was this sort of very well-defined homogeneously dark structure along the dorsal aspect and the volar aspect. And um, the dorsal and volar components can be very, seen really nicely on on the axle images. So just contrast that to what we were seeing, kind of the mush, um, very ill-defined structure we saw on the, on the case where there was um, a, a full uh, thickness scapulinate ligament tear on that prior case. Okay, so I wanna take a second to also mention normal variation because as I started reading more wrist MRI, I started realizing that, oh, well, there's often some signal here and there and I didn't know what that meant. So you can actually have small perforations or communicating defects in the middle portion, and that can be common, and that usually actually doesn't relate to any symptoms when it's isolated. In addition, both the volar and the middle portions can demonstrate heterogeneous or intermediate signals, such as this image right here. Um, and that's because there's a lower density of collagen fibers and a higher proportion of loose connective or vascular tissue in the volar and middle portions. So what you really want to look for is not sort of heterogeneous intermediate signal, but really more fluid signal intensity um, on the T2-weighted images, as we saw in our initial one where it was, you know, there was bright signal basically between the, the ligament itself and the bones um, on either side. Um, the dorsal band, however, tends to be more homogeneously dark. So um, just remember that you can have some intermediate signal in the volar and the middle portions, which can be, can, which can totally be, can be normal. Okay, so this is a sort of companion case. Um, this is a six, 
63 year old male with wrist pain. And I'm gonna show you these images um, for a few seconds. And then I'm gonna give you a Polaroid question. Okay, great. So this, sorry, I have to, I've been using this timer, but okay, great. Um, so this is an example of dorsal intercalated segmental instability, right? And this is a type of scapholunate instability. And it occurs when the scapholunate ligament is completely torn, or as in this case, stretched. And that allows the scaphoid and lunate to dissociate. And the scapholunate, uh, the scaphoid tends to tilt in a volar direction, and then the lunate tilts in a dorsal direction. So if you guys notice on the sagittal, right, this is dorsal tilt of the lunate. And so, so I don't want to complicate things, but you can have some volar and dorsal tilt depending on whether or not your wrist is an extension or not, or radial, radially or ulnar deviated. But what you want to look for is what the capitate and radius axis is. So the capitate remains um, aligned with the axis of the radius, but it's just the lunate itself that's dorsally tilted. And that's different than if, say, you're imaging in a hyperextended position. The capitate and the lunate will still be well aligned, but they'll both be sort of like on an axis like this. So, so this is true, you know, dorsal uh, tilt, not just like a positional tilt. So, um, so dizzy, you probably also heard of Vizzy, which is its sort of sister, the volar intercalated segmental inst instability, but of the two, dizzy is more common. And busy is its counterpart with which um, corresponds to injury to the lunotriquetral ligament. Um, so what happens in dizzy? So you have a scapholunate ligament that's disrupted, and then you get this chronic rotatory instability that can also then lead to scapholunate advanced collapse or slack, slack wrist, right? And what is slack? What are the different components and ingredients that make slack wrist? So you can have disruption of the scapholunate ligament, then that's um, subsequently you develop degenerative arthritis between the scaphoid and the distal radius, and then you get proximal migration of the capitans between the scaphoid and the lunate. And you can also see here, I just wanted to point out that you're already getting some radio scaphoid arthritis here, right? This is sort of broad full thickness chondral loss along the uh, base of the radial styloid and then the scaphoid. Um, and then you have that stretched scaphoid ligament, right? And you can see that there's scaphoid dissociation because there's widening of the scaphoid interval. You don't quite have really marked proximal migration of the capitate yet, but um, these are all sort of things that you're looking for when you're thinking about dizzy and then slack wrist, okay? So that's not a competent scaphoid ligament, even though it looks intact, right? It's very stretched and very abnormal in signal. All right, so next case, 34-year-old female with dorsal wrist pain. I'll give you a second to look at the images and then I'm gonna follow up with a question. Okay, moving on, that's 10 seconds. So this was a ganglion cyst. I know, you know, you're like, oh, I didn't sign on the Zoom to, to learn about ganglion cysts, but this is a really common cause of a mass involving the wrist. And these are fibrous walled masses containing thick mucoid fluid. They can be attached by a pedicle to a tendon sheath, a joint capsule, a ligament, or within a fascial plane. They may or may not be symptomatic. They can actually also erode adjacent osseous structures. So don't think of that as like a reason to not think it's a ganglion cyst. Uh, obviously, you know that there's intraosseous ganglion cysts, so that should be pretty obvious. Often there's thin septations. Um, we can see these nicely on MR or ultrasound if you do ultrasound um, in your institution. And it's important to examine the dorsal scaphoid lunate ligament carefully because even really small occult ganglion cysts that are not palpable on exam can be a common source of dorsal wrist pain. So we see these all the time um, here for ultrasound and sometimes also for um, MR, but mostly on ultrasound. Okay, so that was just a quick one. This is a 34-year-old male with wrist pain, and I'm gonna show you two back-to-back -back cases for this one. So take a look at this image. Sorry, it's not the prettiest image. Um, <clears throat> most of our wrist MRIs do look better than this, I'll tell you. Um, and then this is a different patient, 33-year-old female with wrist injury. And I will tell you that, ignore this. Yes, this patient also has a trapezial bridge fracture, um, but ignore that. Where I'm, I want you to focus on something else that I'm showing on the coronal images on on this and on the prior. <clears throat> 
And I mean also to ignore the vitamin E marker because that's for that. Okay. So next question. Okay, great. So, all right, that's 10 seconds. We're moving forward. So this was a triangular fiber cartilage tear in both cases, right? And they were in different locations. So we'll talk a little, about, a little bit about that after this. But um, the triangular fiber cartilage complex is the primary stabilizer, primary stabilizer of the distal radial ulnar joint. And the triangular fiber cartilage is the main component of the TFCC that is most often abnormal. And we'll talk about what that is. Um, these patients present with ulnar sided wrist pain and tenderness. They can have an audible click with rotation of the forearm. Um, this can manifest as high signal extending through the proximal or distal surface of the TFC. That's, um, you know, that's when you know there's a tear. These tears can be partial or full thickness. They can be peripheral or central. We'll talk about what that means. And then it's important to know that many asymptomatic um, individuals may have high intrasubstance signal from degeneration or small perforations. And these asymptomatic perforations are probably degenerative in nature as most symptomatic tears are traumatic in etiology. So, this is a schematic showing the anatomy of the TFCC, and there are a lot of different components of it, but just going through it um, sort of systematically, there, the dorsal and volar radial ulnar ligaments are part of the TFCC. For the purposes of this schematic, the dorsal radial ulnar ligament is reflected here, but normally it runs from here to here, um, and is on either side of the TFC proper, which is this structure right here. So this is the triangular fiber cartilage itself. Then also part of the TFCC, the complex, is the lunar triquetral ligament, which is here, the meniscal homolog, the ulnar collateral ligament, and then the extensor carpal ulnaris tendon sheath, right? So this is the TFCC. Um, and so this is in, in some example images of the different components. So right here is what they call the central articular disc, right? And then there's also... So that's what's called the, like when people talk about a central tear, that's, that's where they're talking about the disc itself. Then peripheral tears are the foveal attachment and the styloid attachment here. So the fovea, I think of this like as a sort of cup-like or concavity right here. That's the fovea and the styloid, as you all know, is like this little bony prominence here. So styloid. And sometimes you can resolve them, the two of them separately. And sometimes they, they look pretty confluent as almost like one sort of continuous structure. So one thing I want to definitely tell you guys, because this is like what I spend like the first month talking to fellows about um, during in July is, you know, that there are different, there are normal things that exist here that can mimic a tear. So one of them is the ligamentum subcurrentum. And what I'm talking about is this signal right here indicated by the arrowhead, right? So right here, this dash arrow is pointing to the foveal attachment. And then here, this longer, uh, solid arrow is pointing to the styloid attachment. And this is just a histopathologic specimen showing um, the corresponding structures on, on path. So this is the foveal attachment, this is the styloid attachment, and in the middle is the ligamentum subcurrentum. So there is a normal space between the proximal and distal lamina. So this is not a tear. And the other thing I wanna point out to you guys is that just like in other parts of the MSK system where there's some normal striation in different places like the ACL or other places where like, you know, in certain ligaments, it's normally a little bit striated. Um, normally the per peripheral TFC often has some striation. So I wouldn't call that, you know, like interstitial tearing or something like that, okay? And then the central articular disc, it's very important to know that it attached, attaches directly to the radial cartilage here. So that's this intermediate gray, and that's part of the distal radial ulnar joint. So don't ever, you know, mistake this sort of relatively higher signal relative to the disc as a tear. That's just the normal cartilage of the distal radius, and it's supposed to attach directly to the cartilage here. Okay. This is next case. I'll give you a few seconds to look at this case. Don't venture far from where you, we've been thinking, like the structure we've been thinking about too. And then I provided the x-ray for a reason. All right. All right. So good job, everyone. 
So this is all, all no lunate impaction, right? And you guys correctly uh, indicated that this is associated with ulnar positive variants. This is a pain syndrome that's due to chronic abutment of the distal ulna against the proximal lunate. And there's a strong association with ulnar positive variants, which increases the forces across the ulnar side of the wrist. And so the thought is that there's chronic repetitive impaction. This leads to degenerative loss of cartilage of both bones and then a tear of the intervening TFC. So what you'll see often is cartilage defects, bone marrow edema, subchondral cyst formation and sclerosis in the proximal lunate or ulnar head. So let's go back, right? So sometimes alignment is a little bit difficult to see for sure on, on a wrist MRI. So I provided the X-ray to show you that if you're looking at the two articular surfaces, right? Of, um, I mean, the distal radial articular surface and then basically where the ulnar head is, there's probably more than two millimeters of offset, which is basically the, di the diagnosis of some sort of positive or negative ulnar variance, right? Um, and then you see subtly on the X-ray that there's some subchondral cyst formation within the ulnar aspect of the proximal lunate. And then you see that verified on the MR here with subchondral cyst formation. And if you look around here, there's chondral loss already along this surface, right? So if you look at normal cartilage here or here, you just compare it to the cartilage around it. There's missing cartilage here that's just, there's fluid basically touching down the, to the subchondral bone plate. And then just thinking about what we were talking about earlier is, you know, the peripheral attachments look intact, that looks fine. But then here, right, this looks like there's a perforation or tear through the central articular disc of the TFC. And that makes sense, right? Because if you have a long ulna relatively, um, you're gonna get this sort of tearing of the TFC and then you get this degenerative arthritis. Right, so that's all no lunate impaction. Next case, 26 year old male following fall. Awesome. Okay, great. So, so everyone that was clicking around here or here is correct. Okay. So let's talk about this case. So this is an extensor carpi ulnaris tendon dislocation. Okay. So normally the ECU is supposed to live in this groove, it's supposed to sit in this groove really nicely and stay situated there. But now it's basically popped out completely over here right? And then in addition, there's a split tear of the ECU also. And so we'll talk a little bit about um, what all that means. Um, sorry, I should have shown that on the one. Okay, so there's a tear in the ECU proper. This whole tendon should be sitting in this groove, okay? So the fact that it's popped out is totally abnormal. Okay, so, so basically this results as um, from Traumatic, traumatic disruption of the ECU tendon sheath, which is also known as the subsheath. Um, and this can result in subluxation or dislocation of the ECU tendon out of the groove. And it's actually fairly difficult sometimes to see the subsheath with, unless there's fluid within it, um, distending it, I should say. And when it's completely dislocated like this, even if you can't make it out, the, like the subsheath is torn. Um, but there's, you know, all these different, there's nice articles, for example, on rad source that tell you about all the different places the subsheath can be torn. But in this case, it's, it's, it's obvious that it's, it's torn and, and it's most commonly torn along that sort of palmar um, or bowler attachment. And then that's what allows it to sort of slip out around the ulna. Um, and then luckily associated tenosynovitis is, is pretty common. Um, and then one thing I, I just want to make a note of is you don't want to start calling these like willy nilly left and right though. Cause sometimes you, you hear about this and you're really excited and then you start calling subluxation on everyone. And it turns out that um, the position of the ECU in the groove is really, is very dependent on the position of your, the positioning of your wrist. So the ECU is in the groove in a neutral or pronated position but you can see subluxation um, if the wrist is imaged in supination. So I don't really call it um, very much if, if it's kind of only subluxed and if it's definitely, definitely not if it's, if it's not the reason that they're getting the MR. Um, I don't go crazy about calling subsheath tears and subluxation, especially if it's sort of subtle subluxation. In this case, I don't think I would mince any words about it, but um, where it's like frankly dislocated. But it's just important to know that it can be dependent on positioning of the wrist, so to not go crazy about calling this. Okay, next case. I'm gonna go through three sequential images through the structure, um, and then we'll actually four sequential, there's three axial images and a coronal image. Okay. 
All right, everyone, you guys are right, okay? So this is a schematic that talks about all the different extensor tendons. Um, and, you know, you, as a resident, you probably don't have to memorize it at this point, but ultimately, you know, it's, and there are different mnemonics to do it. I ultimately decided that it was easier to just, just remember it um, straight without any mnemonics. Um, it's also easy to just remember that like, there's a pattern of like longest brevis, longest brevis. So if you're just remember that the first one is APL, it kind of starts going pretty easily, APL, EPB, ECRL, ECRB. And then Lister's tubercle is a really important landmark to know between the second and third extensor compartments. Then the third one is the extensor pollicis longus, fourth one is extensor digitorum and indices. Fifth one is digiti minimi, easy to remember because it's you know the fifth, the small finger. And then the sixth one is also remember, easy to remember because it's along the ulna, so it's the ECU. So that's and then, you know, you don't have to worry about knowing the individual names of the flexor tendons. I don't think that's useful for you guys at this point. Um, but these, this is what it looks like in MR. So this is the first compartment, okay, APL, EPB, and then this second compartment, ECRL, ECRB, Lister's tubercle, EPL, and then extensor dig and indices, and then digiti minimi, and then ECU, right? So this is like in a groove here, kind of a flattish groove, but it's it's there. Okay, so just quickly, the extensor tendons are stabilized along the dorsal wrist by the extensor retinaculum. And then these fascial septations of the retinaculum um, form these six dorsal compartments. And the tendon should be oval, round, and low signal on all um, on the axial images. However, and that's part of the reason I'm giving this talk, like there's so much variation of normal, right? So the ECU can have high signal intensity within it normally. And that's normal unless the tendon has fluid around it or morphologically it's abnormally enlarged or thinned in caliber. Small amounts of fluid in tendon sheets can also be normal. So one sort of rule that some people quote as being more specific for actual like pathologic tenosynovitis is it's abnormal only if they're circumferential fluid. So the fluid completely surrounds the tendon. And then there can also be striations in heterogeneous signals simulating long longitudinal tears in certain tendons like the abductor pollicis longus tendon, and this is due to that being interposed between the tendon fascicles. So this is an example of what people are talking about when there's like sometimes some increased signal in the ECU and you may not know what to do about it, right? It turns out that there was a study that showed that um, what accounts for this intermediate inter increased signal, intersubstance signal is actually increased proteoglycan content or mucoid degeneration. And they, they said it's this ground substance that you can see on these histopath. Um, and I think micro CT maybe some specimens. And so that's what accounts for this sort of abnormal signal. So if you see that, you don't have to be calling tears either. That's, that can just be the ground substance. Okay, 60 year old female with 10 months of wrist pain. I think this might be a free text answer question. I was trying to um, mix it up with the types, the types of questions I was using. Love it. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Okay. All right. So this is De Quervain's. This is entrapment and tenosynovitis of the abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis tendons in the first dorsal compartment. It's associated, like you guys said, with pregnancy and repetitive trauma and manual laborers. You can see obliteration of the subcutaneous fat surrounding the tendons. You can see intermediate signal surrounding the tendons. You can get tenosynovitis with high signal fluid surrounding the tendons. The tendons actually may be normal in caliber or thickened. You can get partial thickness tears or degeneration. And then, you know, we actually commonly get asked here to treat these with steroid injection and people usually do pretty well. Okay, that's a quick one. So I'm gonna solve a lot of cases. 56 year old male with wrist pain. This is a little bit unfair because it's not the like, most glaringly obvious instance of this, but it looks like that hasn't affected anybody. Okay, great, awesome. Okay, so most of you guys are pointing in the right direction, uh, in the right location. And so this is proximal intersection syndrome, right? This is an overuse condition resulting in peritendinosis where the first extensor compartment tendons cross over the second extensor compartment tendons. And this occurs four to eight centimeters proximal to Lister's tubercle. So if you think about where that is, if you look at the shape of the bones here, right? This is more in the, in the distal forearm than it is in the wrist, right, proper. So the scanning, like the scanning, if someone's looking for this and you're protocoling a case, you need to mention that the scanning should be extended proximally into the forearm more than the 
the usual risk of obesity sometimes. And this is associated with the activities such as skiing, weightlifting, rowing, shoveling, raking, and you can get abnormal peritendinous signal. Like here we have that intermediate sort of hazy halo of signal surrounding um, the tendons and that be begins at the level of the tendon crossover and then often extends proximally. Obviously you can also get tendinosis and tenosynovitis associated with this. And it's important to know that this is the proximal intersection sy syndrome. So this is proximal to Lister's tubercle, whereas the more distal intersection syndrome occurs as the EPL crosses the ECRL and ECRB and that's distal to Lister's tubercle. And the way I kind of remember what's what is proximal, if you think of it like starting from the center of the body, then proximal is when first and second extensor compartments cross over and distal is when second and third cross over. So it like makes sense that going from proximal to distal, you're going in order of the numbers, one and two, and then two and three. Okay, this should be fairly straightforward, but I'll show you the, the image one more time and then question. Okay, all right. It's just making sure that you guys are awake. Great, so, um, so does everyone see that? This is, so one of the reasons you might get an MRI for a distal radius fracture, which normally we never do, we just get you know radiographs or radiographic follow-up, um, are for non-displaced fractures, right? They can be really difficult to see, but on the T1, you can see that there's a transverse um, fracture line, and then there's also probably an intraarticular one um, without any offset or incongruity or gabbing, but, and then there's the bone marrow edema that you would expect, right? So this is like a good way to, to confirm um, your suspicions. Okay, next case. You guys are really, really good. Okay, so that, I mean, no question, like no, no difficulty here, right? That was a scapegoat fracture. Um, and they're very common, um, it's a very common car carpal fracture. A lot of them involve the waist, they're usually non-displaced, um, and then less commonly involve the proximal one-third or the distal pole. Um, obviously, you can get um, an MR because 20% of these are radiographically occult, so uh, you might see an MR with the fracture. Um, one of the dreaded complications, as you guys know, is avascular necrosis. And why is that? Because this radial dorsal branch, um, radial artery dorsal branch, basically supplies from distal to proximal, right? So if you have a fracture here um, where most of the proximal pole is supplied by interosseous supply, then you're going to predispose this proximal pole to avascular necrosis because of the direction of the vascular supply. So um, if the fracture involves like the proximal one fifth of the scaphoid, you basically will always have AVN without surgical fixation. So that's, um, you want to think about that for sure. And so in that case, right, you guys probably all saw this, you have diffusely low signal of the proximal pole on, low, um, on T1. You also have diffuse sclerosis on CT. You have this non-united scaphoid waist fracture. The scaphoid, um, there's no fragmentation or collapse yet, but it definitely looks almost kind of small, right, and diminutive. And you also have early radio scaphoid arthritis, right? So you have marginal osteophyte formation and joint space narrowing affecting the joint space, right? So, um, but what I wanted to highlight here was something that I hadn't really known about until I was in fellowship, which is that, you know, these, these scaphoid waist fractures can heal in malunion. So, or not heal, but develop this, um, this abnormal configuration, which is called the humpback deformity. And that's when the distal pole of the scaphoid flexus volar with respect to the proximal pole. And this, this results in a decrease in the scaphoid height to length ratio. And this is very abnormal for mechanics. So they'll typically want to realign this anatomically and fix this. Um, and so it's just important to know that sometimes they might be looking like for this and to know that. And sometimes it can be difficult to see on, on radiographs to make sure that that's actually there. So sometimes they'll get CTs to look to verify that there is a humpback deformity. Okay, next case. This is the corresponding x-ray. Very nice. I like the live uh, adjustments. Okay, so this is lunate avascular necrosis, right? This is kind box disease. This can result result as um, from repetitive trauma, an acute fracture, or or ulnar negative variants. Um, that's so the way I remember 
the variance is it's very um, with ulnar lunate impaction that makes sense right ulnar abutment long ulna ulnar positive variance and then the other one's the other one so I think Kindbach is is ulnar negative you don't have to like um, ever get it you know confused so most patients are involved in manual labor for this the lunate has a tenuous blood supply that's provided by end arteries and then it's also subject to strong compressive to force forces due to the central position within the wrist and what you're looking for is low signal on t1 and t2 of the entire bone and apparently you know it it really should be darkest cortical bone or at least darker than muscle and that's more predictive of osteonecrosis at surgery so the case that we showed wasn't really um, a diagnostic dilemma but that's you know sometimes that there's there might be a little bit of low signal but it's not quite that dark and you might not be sure but um, you really are looking for quite uniformly very dark signal Okay, 31 year old male with wrist pain and swelling. All right, interesting. Okay, so I'm glad we're doing this talk. So that was the title of this talk. That was the carpal boss, right? So this is a dorsal bony protuberance or ossicle between the trap trapezoid or capitate and the second and third metacarpal bases. There are many theories for what this is caused by, none agreed upon. It may be due to the os styloidium, which is a known accessory ossicle at this location, or it could also be due to CM uh, carpal metacarpal osteophytes often will present with dorsal wrist pain and swelling. It may be fragmented like in the one that we saw or it can be smoothly attached to the underlying bone. You may or may not have cysts, bone marrow edema or soft tissue prominence. And then you can have symptoms that are due to osteoarthritis, adventitial bursts or ganglion formation or extensor tendon impingement. So I'll just show a few more cases here. So here on the X-ray is what we're looking at, right? And that's on the MR, this is the abnormal interface between the small little ossicle and then the, um, the third metacarpal base, right? So this is the third metacarpal base and then you see opposing marrow edema and cysts, right? And you see this. Um, so what I'm showing on the X-ray is that similar sort of abnormal interface there with some de degeneration. This is a different case where, like I said, it doesn't have to be fragmented. It can be like a smooth excrescence coming off the base of the third metacarpal. And then this is a different one where it is the separate ossicle and there's similar sort of bone marrow edema and cyst um, across the interface. And then on top of that, you can see some evidence of extensor tendon impingement with dorsal sort of um, positioning or translation of the extensor tendons with some tenosynovitis or um, abnormal signals surrounding the tendons here. And that's just because you can see here on this sort of coronally oriented schematic, the extensor tendons basically um, cross this area. Okay. 74 year old female concern of mass within the carpal tunnel. So now I'm gonna show you some weirder cases going forward. So just um, FYI. Um, and the, and the in an older patients that are often the whole wrist kind of looks bad. So I'll just focus on the history, the carpal tunnel and the numbness in the hand, okay? And these are, I'm showing you two separate levels for a reason. So the first image, I just want you guys to, to click on what you think is abnormal. Okay. All right, good. And then the next image, click on what you think is abnormal in this slice. Okay, good. So I'm gonna go back and just show you guys what's abnormal, okay? So I wanted you guys to ignore this stuff because this is all, extensor compartment, extensor tendon stuff, right? We're talking about the carpal tunnel here. So you really wanna be focusing on the carpal tunnel, right? And if she's talking about numbness, in the, if she has numbness in the hand, and if I told you it was like the first three, the thumb through the third finger and maybe half of the fourth finger, then you're really looking at the median nerve. So easy thing here is this is the median nerve right here. It's very enlarged, it's increased in signal. So it's very abnormal, but you know, why, right? So looking at this image here, Normally, the flexor tendons are all generally kind of the same um, size, right? So then you'll notice going around that there's like this extra glob of low signal here. So you have to wonder what that might be. There usually aren't any tendons that are that large um, and usually tendons don't merge, you know, like this. So um, there's something there. So my next question 
is, you know, you're reading this case and you have access to packs in the patient jacket and what, what would you want next? What would you ask for if you could have anything? Like what would help clarify that for you about what that blob of low signal is made of? Okay, perfect. Okay, awesome. Okay, great. So I'm gonna give what most of you asked for. And so what I want you to look at is here, right? So there's a calcification and that, that corresponds to what that was, right? And actually when this was read out, someone said that, you know, they thought this was calcium hydroxyapatite, which is like had, you know, it's like calcific tendinosis. Um, turned out on PATH when they took this out, they said it was more like tumoral calcinosis. But regardless, the point of sort of thinking about this was like that that's abnormal, that doesn't belong there. And then there, that can be a secondary cause of carpal tunnel syndrome. So carpal tunnel syndrome, the vast majority of carpal tunnel syndrome isn't gonna, isn't gonna be due to a space occupying lesion, but I'm, I just wanted to show that case. So this is the most common compressive neuropathy of the upper extremity. We don't actually usually get MRI to diagnose um, carpal tunnel syndrome because usually the clinical history and the nerve conduction studies are enough. Um, but we can assess for an underlying cause of it, such as in this case, when the conduction studies are equivocal or if the patient has recurrent or persistent symptoms after surgery. And what you're looking for is focal or segmental swelling of the median nerve, flattening or angulation of the nerve. You get bowing of the flexor ratinaculum. I wouldn't worry about the bowing ratio, but there is a measurement you can make to make sure, because there is some normal palmar bowing of the ratinaculum. So not all bowing is abnormal, but it has to be above a certain sort of threshold for it to be so considered sort of more pathologic. And then you get increased T2 signal of the median nerve from obstruction of venous return um, due to that compressive neuropathy. Um, and then that manifests as edema or increased signal within the nerve, which is what we saw on our case. All right, so kind of living in, this, in the same land, now we have an 18 year old female, painful palm on mass for one year and finger numbness. Okay, I think I have a group of people that just like literally took the boards, right? So, <laughs> all right, so this is a fibrolipomatous hamartoma. This is a benign nerve lesion. It arises from the nerve with, um, with often associated with enlargement of the nerve, infiltration with fibrous and fatty tissue. It can be asymptomatic, but it, as in this case, nerve compression can develop if it's large enough. And two thirds of patients with macrodystrophia lipomatosa, which is a localized form of gigantism, have fibrolipomatous hamartoma. So you might look for, you know, large in large bones or soft tissues of a certain finger that's basically what this usually looks like <clears throat> and it's just important to know that this is path and mnemonic on mri so you shouldn't have any you know people trying to biopsy this because the fat signal and the coaxial what they call a coaxial cable appearance or the spaghetti appearance basically give this away um, and that's it can't really be anything else um and just so it's clear this is like this is the median nerve. There's all this fat signal. And then you see, you know, the different fascicles looking very wavy and redundant. Okay, 66 year old female with wrist pain. So I think second to last case. So I'm almost done. Sorry, I'm going a little over. Right. Okay. Yeah. So this was a case of eosinophilic fasciitis. Okay. So what I want to show you again is this is, I should have, sorry, I should have said that this is the fluid sensitive sequence and then this is pre and post contrast. So what you're looking at is in the flexor compartment, you see sort of abnormal increased signal along the fascial lines of, of the muscles and tendons. Right. And then on the pre, there's no abnormal signal, but on the post, you see enhancement where there's um, the abnormal signal on the fluid sensitive, right? So there's something, there's a fascial process going on, right? Map, like centered on the fascia. Doesn't look traumatic. There isn't any sort of like obvious soft tissue edema everywhere or anything like that. So this is eosinophilic, 
eosinophilic fasciitis. It's a rare sclerogenic-like disorder. Um, on labs, the patients have peripheral eosinophilia, hypergammaglobulinemia, and elevated ESR. On exam, they have skin induration, edema, stiffness, swelling, pain. On MRI, they have thickening and increased signal and enhancement of the fascia, as we saw. Um, to diagnose this, like definitively, you actually need to have a full thickness epidermis to muscle biopsy. But the MRI can be helpful because it can direct, just like in myositis, the optimal biopsy location. Um, and the imaging findings parallel disease activity. So MRI is also helpful for that. So in this case, you know, this is pre and post steroids. For some reason, it's not, oh yeah. So this is pre-steroids, right? We see this is a more sort of florid case um, in another patient where there's just fascial enhancement um, and thickening. And then um, this is post-contrast. And then post-steroids, you see a lot of that enhancement resolved and it just looks a lot quieter than it, than it was. Okay, 35 year old female, different person, um, dorsal hand palpable abnormality. All right, I'm glad you guys all came to play. Good. Okay, so. This is the abnormality here. So normally there isn't a muscle here. And I was trying to sort of like clue you into that because I said dorsal hand and there's probable abnormality. Um, so what is this? This is the extensor digitorum brevis manus and it's an accessory muscle. It's a normal anatomic variant. Origin is the distal radius and the insertion is along the extensor hood of the second and third digits, although, although it can be variable. It's present in 3% of the population. It can be bilateral in 50%. I've definitely had patients come and had their hands scanned bilaterally and they have bilateral accessory muscles here. So um, you will see this. Um, it's usually painless. It can present as a mass. Um, and then it can be associated with exercise-induced pain or extensor tenosynovitis um, due to its location. And then obviously, since it's a muscle, it's gonna be iso-intense to muscle and look like a muscle for all intents and purposes. So that's just a cute case of uh, accessory muscle in the hand. Okay, so in summary, just to wrap up, we talked about the anatomy, um, the complex but interesting anatomy of the scaphalinate ligament and the TFC. We talked about all the different normal findings of signal within the scaphalinate ligament, the ECU, the TFC, what tears of the scaphalinate ligament, ECU and TFC look like, um, what to think about when you see tendon dislocation, tenosynovitis, and the various syndromes like intersection syndromes. And then we talked about some bone abnormalities such as AVN and fractures, and then nerve abnormalities such as carpal tunnel and um, fibrolipomatous hamartoma. And then we just ended with um, some miscellaneous cases like the muscle variant and fascial abnormalities with eosinophilic fasciitis. So I'm just gonna finish um, with this post-test and just to get a sense of if this is at all helpful. I'm very sorry that it was kind of a whirlwind tour, but I wanted to pack as much as possible in there um, to cover as much ground as possible. Okay, yeah. Okay, great. I can live with that. I think there's a somewhat upward shift um, in terms of the scoring. So, so thank you guys for your attention. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions that there may be um, in the remaining time that we have. Awesome. Thanks, Dana. Wonderful talk. <clears throat> um, if you guys have any questions, um, please put them in the question and answer section of the um, Zoom meeting and uh, we'll, we can go over them. Um, so while we're, while we're waiting for that, Dana, um, one um, thing I was hoping you could maybe expound on is can you talk about maybe the, the template that you guys have for wrist MRI and kind of a checklist that you, know, you teach um, your trainees to kind of go through so that we don't forget anything. I think you kind of did some of that in your summary slide, but maybe you can kind of, um, you know, talk a little bit more about that just to reinforce that for our, for our trainees here. Yeah, sure. I'd, happy to, I'd be happy to do that. So um, obviously you can do it in any order you would like. The way our macro is set up, um, it's a structured report. The first section, at least the one that I use most commonly is bones and joint spaces. So, and that's how I, I read too. So first I just look at the coronal T1 and the coronal PDFS. And I just take a like a quick look at all the bones, um, make sure there's no you know bone marrow edema, there's no fracture. Look at the alignment, make those make sure there's no dislocation, and then I start to look at the joint spaces um, and the cartilage to see if there's any arthritis anywhere. Um, 
any joint effusion, any synovitis, obviously other things that you might get a wrist MR for are like rheumatoid arthritis. So you might also sort of, it may not be in your macro, but you should obviously think about that if you're getting it from a room for, um, are there, is there osteo, um, are there osteous erosions? Is there periostitis? Is there synovitis? Is there tenous synovitis? Um, so all of those things related to the bones. Um, and then after that, I think ours starts with the scapholunate ligament. So then I basically use the coronal and go front to back, um, or I guess dorsal to volar and look at those different components of the scapholunate ligament. Then I'll check that on the axials, dorsal and volar, looking for that, that the apposition, the close apposition, the no, you know, normal morphology. Um, alignment again of the, the scapholunate and the lunate on the sagittal maybe. Um, and then the next, the next one after that, I think, is the lunotriquetral ligament. And I really struggled with how much to talk about that because I was trying to get through a lot of things. But the lunotriquetral ligament is also important um, for carpal instability. It's the second most important um, intrinsic ligament and connects the lunate and the triquetrum. Like I touched upon a little bit, there's um, you can get busy if you get uh, if you have a tear of the lunar triquetral ligament, there also are some normal variants. I didn't get to get like go through today, but they're they can often have sort of these vertically oriented clefts that are partial or complete that go kind of like through the triangular portion, like the membranous portion of it, which is like the middle portion um, analogous to the middle portion of the scapholunar ligament. Um, so I'll look at the lunar triquetral ligament. It's much smaller than the other the scapholunar, so it can be difficult to to be confident in your diagnosing those tears. But they're also thankfully less common um, than scapholinic ligament pathology. So that's scapholinic ligament, then lunotriquetral ligament. I think the next thing after that for us is the triangle fiber cartilage complex. So I'm mainly looking on the coronal for the TFCC. I know some people like, I know I didn't, you know, people will use the sagittal. Like I think Mark Schweitzer, or at least I hear this anecdotally because I didn't work with him myself, but he uses the sagittal for, for the TFCC. But I mostly use the, the coronal and I'm looking for those things that I talked about, central articular disc, and then the peripheral attachments. Um, you can get more fancy and look, I wanted to focus on those because that's like probably the most important part of the entire complex. But yeah, you can also get tears of the volar and dorsal radial ulnar ligaments, et cetera. Um, so you want to kind of evaluate all of that as well. Um, and then followed by that are the different tendons. So I think it's either extensor tendons followed by flexor tendons or flexor tendons. Followed. So I then I'll look at all the tendons, um, each compartment, make sure there's no tendinosis, tenosinovitis, tendon tears. I will take an extra, like, I definitely take an extra look at the ECU just because I feel like we're so prone to overcalling things there that I've over time titrated my like, sort of pull myself back, maybe under call now. Um, but yeah, I look at the extensor tendons and then the flexor tendons. Um, and then after that, I have, I think we have the neurovascular structures on our macro. So then that's when I look at the median nerve, um, the carpal tunnel. I look at Guillain's canal, which I didn't talk about today, but that's where the ulnar nerve and artery the neurovascular bundle runs and that's sort of on the other side of the wrist um, next to the pisiform. And so look for and the hook of the handmate. Um, so, and I think there might, the last couple of things might be like musculature and subcutaneous soft tissues just to make sure every everything else is okay. But that's basically how I march through the wrist based on the, the macro that we have and to organize like how to approach the wrist. Great. I know. I think that's very helpful. Um, we do have a few questions in our question and answer thing. And, and maybe let's start with the first and kind of go down. Um, do you have a great uh, resource that you recommend for your trainees for uh, wrist uh, MRI anatomy? Well, I always, early on for myself, I use eAnatomy, IMIOS. Um, I still sometimes use that, especially if there's, you know, like there's no, I, I don't think there's any shame in doing that. I mean, I know the extensor compartments by heart, but still sometimes you just want to check, especially with the flexor tendons, you may not think about them that often. Um, there's also a really good article in radiographics about some of the pitfalls that I talked about. Um, I can try and send that out. I don't have the link right now. I just cited in my, in my, in my um, talk because I took some of the histopathology um, things. I also, um, one reference I think in general for MRI that's really helpful is um, what used to be Clyde Helms, like musculoskeletal MRI text. But I think the first author is now Nancy Major. And that like has, like I think at a resident and early fellow level, like what you really need to know for any joint on MRI. Um, yeah, and I, um, yeah. So that's, that's I think the first question, right? Yeah. 
And then the, we have kind of two similar questions, which is about uh, the drudge and seeing, seeing a little bit of fluid in the drudge, um, whether that means that there's a, uh, a pathology of the TFCC or could it just be you know, related to something else? Um, you know, what, what do you, how do you um, handle that one? Yeah, that's a good question. I think a small amount of fluid there can be normal. I mean, luckily you have, if you have an MRI in front of you, then you can actually look at the TFC directly to, to, to determine whether or not there's an abnormality, right? I think what you're kind of getting at is like how people used to sort of diagnose TFC tears, which, which is the, you know, they used to do an arthrogram and inject, you know, under fluoro, I guess, um, the radiocarpal joint and see if it, then you saw fluid, you know, extend into the distal radial joint, and that would tell you that there was a TFC tear. But I don't, I don't think I, uh, you know, does it maybe? I don't even know if it adds confidence that there's a ton of fluid. I mean, if there's a ton of fluid, but then the TFCC, from what I can tell, is intact, I'm still not going to call it TFC tear, um, you know, because there are other causes of effusions, like especially in we get wrist MRIs for inflammatory conditions all the time, rheumatoid patients and stuff like that, and you can have effusion from that, you know, or JRA patients or whatever. So. Um, yeah, I would just scrutinize like all the structures that we talked about, the central articular disc and the different, the peripheral attachments and make sure all of that's intact. And then I wouldn't be swayed by the effusion just because it's there. But I mean, it's a good question. I think uh, right. that there, like anything else, there can be trace fluid in there that's physiologic and I don't. You know. and, and that's where sometimes MR arthrography, if you do that can be helpful because then if you do a radiocarpal injection and you see contrast going into the right. drugs, then, then that definitely does indicate that there probably is a is a um, perforation or a tear in the TFC. That might be a cult, yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Along the same lines of, of kind of uh, joint effusion synovitis, you know, one other question was um, if, uh, how do you distinguish between inflammatory arthritis and OA, you know, when you're looking at like, you know, often, you know, on wrists, we see little cysts in the carpal bones and, and you see some joint effusion, some synovitis, you know, it can be mechanical, it can be uh, from inflammatory arthritis. Any, any tips for our um, listeners? Yeah, and that's a great question. Um, you know, I usually try and, for the, for the cases that are really, really mild, I agree, it can be really difficult. And then we do have conversations with rheumatologists and try to piece together clinically what they're thinking, whether or not they have a higher most suspicion. Um, the, Obviously, if you have like, there, there are common, commonly we'll see intraosseous ganglion cysts or prominent even vascularity in like the capitate, the scaphoid, like things like that. Those are pretty common. It helps obviously if it's more centered in the center of the bone than subchondral in location, especially if like, you know, in terms of erosions, if the subchondral bone plate is not intact and it looks like something, some sort of synovial process eroded it from outside in, then that's helpful. Um, Again, the constellation of findings really helps. So I'm looking for like patchy bone marrow edema, the distribution, right? I mean, no different from radiographs. Like, is it mostly carpus? Is it MCP? Is it, you know, um, is there synovitis? Like, does the, the fusion look like junky and complex, right? Um, or is there sort of tenus synovitis? So I think then you get more of like a flavor of what's going on. I mean, if it's just an isolated sort of like bright little bubble in like a bone, I'm not going to get excited about that or even two like here and there. I, get, I think over time, as you read more, you get a sense of like what the case kind of smells like. I don't know if that makes any sense. And um, yeah, I think you have to kind of put everything together with both the history, the physical exam, and then um, like what the morphology of those, those the sort of the round you know, things that you're looking at, um, that makes any sense. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I think it can be very tricky just on imaging. And I think looking at the whole clinical picture, other, you know, radiographs, you know, history, obviously, if it's a, if it's a 60 year old, and, you know, they've never had a history of uh, yes. you know, inflammatory arthritis, then, you know, it's probably not inflammatory arthritis, um, as opposed to, you know, them developing rheumatoid arthritis at that age. So I think I, I, I completely agree with you. But on imaging, sometimes it is it is, um, can be um, difficult to distinguish because there's a lot of overlap. Well, you know, um, you know, there are a few more questions, but I think for, um, you know, we're up to the uh, eight o'clock hour. So I think we should try to wrap it up and let people, um, you know, get on with their evening and, and um, you know, have some, have some dinner and, and as well as yourself. Uh, first, I want to thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I think it was very uh, helpful 
uh, hopefully, um, you know, the, the people listening also felt that. I also want to, um, you know, just remind everybody that um, this is the final um, talk for this season's uh, Resident Education Club webinar. Um, but we will, uh, you know, uh, start again, um, you know, in, in, in a few months uh, with, with uh, the, the next set of uh, lectures. So uh, keep an eye on that in your email and on the SSR website. Uh, thanks, everyone, and, and have a wonderful evening. And thank you, Dana. Thank you. Have a good night.